We are so fortunate to have Judith Green with us today. She's with Texas Parks and Wildlife as an urban biologist in San Antonio. Thank you so much for having me tonight. And uh, tonight's topic, um, as was mentioned, we're gonna focus a little bit more on shade gardening. And of course, um, when we use native plants, we're enhancing habitat for a variety of wildlife. Um, I am, of course, um, stationed here in San Antonio. This is my contact information. Either do a screenshot um, or a screen save if you want to, or um, take a picture so you have my information if you have any questions down the road. Um, here in San Antonio, um, we do have the Monarch Champion City um, that the mayor has taken on as well as Bird City, Texas. And I do know that some of the local surround communities um, are considering doing some of these as well. I know um, uh, Bernie, I believe, has taken on Bird City, uh, Texas. And um, I think also the I think also the Monarch Champion City. So some of the outlying cities and communities um, can further enhance some of the habitat we create for some of these species. But of course, as most of you probably know, um, many of these ventures oftentimes, even though they do focus on a particular species um, because of the program itself, um, oftentimes they benefit a variety of wildlife. It doesn't just necessarily, if you're doing things for birds, for instance, because they're your love in your garden, um, you are truly oftentimes benefiting so many other wildlife species um, in your neighborhood and in your community. Um, I also just wanted to quickly mention Nature Rocks, uh, sanantonio.org, if you are, um, and it does encompass an outlying area, not just Bear County. It's also include, includes the surrounding communities, um, and we have a variety of partners, and they oftentimes post ongoing activities, um, so that way the community itself knows what's going on within the area. Um, that may allow them to participate in various activities or classes um, and such. And or if we have visitors, sometimes they're coming within our community and they don't know what they can do with their families. And of course, this is intended primarily for families. So it includes not only just adult information, but also um, information for children. So if you have uh, youth and adult activities, um, you may consider trying to um, join the Nature Rock San Antonio group so that you can um, be part of that community. And of course, we welcome um, adding your activities onto this website so we can let uh, our, our residents as well as our visitors know what's going on here in this area, central part of Texas. And there are other um, communities throughout the state of Texas that have their regions too. So if you go to naturerocks.org, you'll see the other communities that also post their events. So if you're visiting other parts of the state, you can find out what they're doing. Um, if you happen to be visiting on a given weekend or week or whatever. Let me see, I just want to... I'm trying, oh, there we go. Okay, so, um, you know, in our urban areas especially, and I'm gonna count New Braunfels as an urban area because even our smaller communities, um, they oftentimes mimic what we are doing in the larger cities by, um, you know, as far as development is concerned. And so of course, um, this is an image up here of the Cibolo Nature Center in Bernie. Um, and, you know, oftentimes these natural areas um, during development wind up being lost. And so what we wind up with oftentimes is um, an image that you see on the bottom left where you have uh, large vast neighborhoods and oftentimes during development, any natural habitat is lost during development. Um, it's up to, in many cases, the homeowner to put back what was possibly there. And many homeowners, as you all well know, um, in your venture, to reaching the public, even in the New Braunfels area, that most people aren't natural gardeners. So they don't necessarily know what a plant will uh, do for wildlife or how it will grow. And they oftentimes fall back on going to local box stores for their plants. So they'll go to the local nurseries at Walmarts um, and or Home Depots, uh, Lowe's. And these, uh, unfortunately, these stores don't carry much in the way of natives, unless there is a propensity to ask for natives. And, and if you get lucky, sometimes you can work with the manager and they actually sometimes will incorporate more natives. So it really is a matter of just working with your local stores to see if they can incorporate more. So that way that does sometimes filter out into the community. Um, Texas Parks and Wildlife historically had a Texas Wildscapes or Backyard Wildlife Habitat Program that we promoted for the last 20 years. 
Um, but we have since, because of um, downsizing with um, uh, um, our staff, we have decided to revert back to allowing the National Wildlife Federation to take on that um, effort again. Um, they originally were the ones who started it back in the 70s and in the early 90s, Parks and Wildlife took that program and really kind of created a plant list for Texas, according to the eco regions that we have here in Texas. So we do have that plant list and some of that is now on the um, wildflower uh, Center's uh, website. I'll be talking about that here in just a minute. So much of our information is on their website. So it's being housed there. Um, but we are no longer certifying habitats. However, the National Wildlife Federation still is and has been for many, many years. So we, if you're wanting to go that route of actually getting your yard certified, that would really be the route to go. However, Parks and Wildlife still, of course, um, wants um, our residents throughout the state of Texas to, of course, plant native plants whenever possible. The criteria that you see here is really what we had created originally with our backyard certification program, and it's what we obviously promote to this day. First and foremost, if you have land that you acquire, retain what you have first and foremost. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, I used to say one year, now I say three and even more years until you really get to know what you have on your property. Uh, for instance, um, you know, if you're, you've got a typical urban lot and you happen to have some native plantings that were still intact when you bought the house, um, you know, just get to know what those plants are using either iNaturalist um, and or maybe reaching out um, to, of course, some of your uh, fellow members to see if they can help you identify what you have before you remove anything and maybe even create a base plant of the plants that you have on your property. Um, and of course, if you're talking acreage, that's even more important because so often people who move out into the country and have their little slice of heaven, they oftentimes think that, well, you know, I'll clear all the mess and I'll kind of start with a clean slate. The problem with that is, is you may be removing some really valuable plants that you just didn't even know you had there. And sometimes even over the course of the three to five year period that I suggest kind of just looking and learning about your land, oftentimes things may start cropping up from the seed base that's already in the soil there. And maybe previous to, you know, whoever owned the land previous to you, they may have been mowing it constantly. And so you may not even realize some of the wealth that you have of plants in the ground there. So again, um, you know, take your time. And then of course, if you have um, acreage, I recommend using seed, you know, that helps to cut down cost, um, but don't use the seed mixes that you typically find um, in stores or, in, in, or even online um, when you're ordering. I always recommend trying to focus on maybe three to five species of uh, plants that you want to incorporate on your land and purchase those for each season that you have. So four different seasons, you wanna have a minimum of at least three species of seeds that bloom during that season, and then try to incorporate that on um, your property, especially if you have larger acreage. And that also can even apply to backyard habitat if you, you've got a large area that you possibly wanna incorporate a wildflower uh, patch in. And of course, we recommend using native plants, ideally, bless you, Ideally, um, you want to have at least 50% um, natives. We know people love their plants sometimes from outside of the state. Um, we do encourage, of course, if you can do all natives, that would be wonderful. Um, but if you can't, that's fine. Um, but make sure they're not invasive plants that you're incorporating in your landscape. And there you would check with invasive, uh, texasinvasives.org. They have a list of all the invasive species that um, we try to discourage people from planting. China berry is one example. Even Nandina is on their list. And many people have those plants sometimes in their current landscapes and they don't realize that they're considered invasive. Of course, when you're planting your property, um, you want to look at the plant. And I typically tell the person who may not be very familiar with gardening in general to focus on how does that plant provide a food source? Um, focus on that aspect of the plant. As um, if you select for the food that it provides, whether it's a bloom or some type of special fruit that may be very attractive, year round and or you know that birds love or other insects love or mammals love, whatever animal it is or wildlife it is that you're trying to attract, focus on the food aspect of that plant, bloom or fruit. And then subsequently as that plant matures, ultimately you'll get to witness firsthand 
how it also provides some type of cover. And that cover can be for, um, you know, getting out of harm's way from maybe a predator um, and or how it may offer nesting opportunities. And of course, adding that last component of water and providing a clean source of that year round really kind of um, creates that, that backyard habitat that I'm talking about that really will benefit a variety of wildlife. And of course, um, I mentioned already planting the different seasons and that's what I'm talking about when I say offer something year round, make sure you have something blooming or fruiting throughout the different seasons. So ultimately year round, so you will have wildlife being able to benefit from your landscape um, throughout the year. And if you can emulate local natural habitats nearby, that would be great. Um, and then the last thing I just wanna mention is that vertical layering with different plant heights. Many times we have tall trees or we have very low growing uh, plantings, but we miss that middle layer or that um, uh, mid-story level. And so that oftentimes, especially if you're wanting to attract birds and a variety of pollinators, those are very important plants to incorporate into your landscape. So keep that in mind of adding, you may just, you may have some of the basic foundation of plants. You just may wanna add a little bit more um, small to tall shrubs, to small ornamental trees, to maybe larger ornamental trees and small trees per se. Um, so a variety of plant heights will benefit a variety of wildlife. I also mentioned here, Doug Talame. Um, I highly encourage you, if you have not heard about him, please uh, look his um, name up on YouTube and watch some of his videos. He's got an amazing array of videos already online. And most of them do focus on how our backyards really benefit a variety of wildlife, but especially birds. And it's not so much the plantings, but even the insects that we are attracting to our backyards. Those are the basic food uh, sources for many young wildlife that originally, uh, that, uh, meet, uh, that come about in the spring. So a lot of the caterpillars, it's a soft food source that birds love to feed their, their young. So again, a very important aspect. And um, he also recognizes that, you know, as we progress in the state of Texas, we have probably 30 million people now here in the state. And, um, we're, of course, developing most of the state. Eventually, most of our state, if you've traveled from San Antonio to Austin, I'm sure most of you recognize that it's very hard to tell one community from the next as you travel northbound. And so um, this homegrown national park is a concept um, that he's kind of created. And it, again, it piggybacks along with the Wildscapes program and the National Wildlife Federation's Backyard Habitat program. It's just a different way of kind of getting people excited about doing things on their property, even in urban areas when they have only a small backyard property. So the idea is, is that, you know, the urban areas ultimately will be the only land. I mean, obviously we're gonna all be living on uh, properties in urban areas. And if we're not incorporating or putting back some of the native plantings, then ultimately it's going to be to the demise of many of our species of wildlife um, that visit our state or that rely on our state as they migrate through or that they reside in year round. So that homegrown national park is intended to also create habitat throughout our nation so that we can, again, put back those natives and benefit a lot of our wildlife. And of course, many of us benefit from nature in, in our in and around us, um, both health-wise, mentally, our young people learn much better when they're um, in, in, um, engulfed in, and in outdoor areas learning and um, just as they're healthier, happier kids for the most part. So in the state of Texas, um, we have it broken out to into these different ecological regions. And all that means is that we have a variety of different rainfall throughout the state and that, and we also have a variety of different soil types and those um, in turn create the different types of plantings that thrive in these ecoregions. Um, New Braunfels is primarily number three and number four. So number three would be your black land prairies, um, clay soils, if you have a lot of um, erosion, um, swelling of the soil, it's black clay. So during wet periods, it just, the, the, the soil of course fills up with moisture, holds on to it. And then oftentimes many people in these areas have foundation problems because the foundation rises and, and falls um, as things dry out and as things get wet again. So um, that's one big clue. Um, of course, uh, when it dries out, you have these big crevices that sometimes you could lose uh, a pet in. You know, all of a sudden you're walking with your pet across your yard and all of a sudden you turn around and they're missing. So um, again, that's a joke, um, but that's one way to tell if you have black clay soils. Um, number four, which is um, our hill country, I'm sorry, I misspoke. 
Number four is our black clay soil. So that's what I was just speaking of. And then number seven, sorry about that. Number seven is our Edwards Plateau or black land, or excuse me, um, uh, hill country is another name that people refer to it as. So number seven, oftentimes the way you can tell if you live in hill country soils is um, that oftentimes when you start digging, you oftentimes hit rock. You don't get to dig very deep in, in these kind of soil conditions. Now do keep in mind if you're living in a truly urbanized area, oftentimes developers will bring in topsoil. So sometimes you have to dig quite a distance before you actually hit the natural soil that was there uh, originally. So that is something to keep in mind. <laughs> so let me just reiterate again, number four and number seven are the two um, ecological regions that are probably going to be found in New Braunfels um, along I-35. And I-35, for the most part, is almost that dividing line. Not always, but um, for the most part, it can be kind of considered if you live east of I-35, you're probably going to be number four, which is your Blackland Prairies. And if you're west of there or left on the left side, you, uh, heading northbound, you'd be Hill Country or Edwards Plateau. And the reason I mentioned the eco regions is because as you're looking at plants um, that we're going to be talking about today, it is important to know what they normally thrive in, what kind of soils they normally thrive in. Thankfully, many of our plants thrive in a variety of soils, um, but some of them are very particular. And so before you spend a lot of money on a plant, um, especially if you're going to be doing a lot of planting, it is important to know, um, you know, is this plant a good fit for, for my eco region, for where I live and where I intend on planting. Um, the, the, uh, the probably my favorite book um, of all of these that I think is the best resource is the one um, called Native Texas Plants. It's the, the one kind of in the middle. I don't know if you can see my arrow moving. I hope you can. Um, but it's Native Texas Plants by Sally Wasowski. And I encourage you to get the second edition. Um, it's the one that is a little bit more user-friendly. She has a map, kind of like the uh, map I just got through showing you with the eco regions highlighted. And um, she references those eco regions by number in her book. So all you have to do is if you flip through her book, you see beautiful pictures of plants. And if there's something that catches your eye, you look down under uh, range and it'll list the, the eco region by number. So if you know your number eight in her book, then you just look for all the number eights throughout the book. Um, if, it's, if it doesn't have eight listed, um, unless you know someone, I mean, there is a chance that sometimes some of these plants will do okay. If you're willing to take a chance on a plant and it's not too costly for you to do that, if you're not buying like a mature plant that costs you $25 or more, and you know, just costs you maybe $3 for a small four inch pot, and you're willing to take a chance on it to see how it does in your in your area, then you know you can obviously uh, take a chance on it if it's native um, to the the overall region of your of where you're living around uh, New Braunfels. But these are a variety of different books. I do like the Texas Wildscapes book. The first edition has the extensive plant list. Unfortunately, faux pas happened and the index was not printed. So if you happen to chance upon the first edition um, and you would like a copy of the index, we actually have one typed up and I can send that to you. You just need to email me and just write in the subject uh, index for first edition of the Wildscapes book. Um, but there are, again, a variety of different plants. If you're in the hill country, and even if you're not, even if you're in Blackland Prairies, I love the Marshall Enquest book on the bottom right. Um, his um, is titled Wildflowers of the Texas Hill Country. But what I love about his field guide is that he takes close-ups of all of the plants. And in order to identify a plant on your property, you definitely have to have the flower as well as the leaf to help you identify the plant. That's the easiest way, unless you're a real pro. Um, and you can look at a stem. I'm not one of those. Um, I like to have the flower and the, the leaf to help me identify the plant. And so I love that all of his are consistently the same throughout the book. And you do have to kind of reference the size of the plant um, as you're looking through, but it's not just forbs or small soft bodied wildflowers. It's also shrubs and trees in his book. Anything that has a beautiful bloom is in his book for the most part, if you're in the hill country. And some of those wildflowers, um, the forbs also fall over into Blackland Prairie uh, too. So you may be able to get lucky and use his book for some of that identification as well for some of the true wildflowers. So keep that in mind as a really good resource book. Um, the other resources that I wanna recommend before we get into plants, because um, before I show you a lot of the plants, I want you to be familiar with these sources because as they say, if you um, teach a man to fish, you, uh, you feed him for a lifetime. So I hope you, We'll reference these websites. Of course, you know about the Native Plant Society. 
Um, and many of you probably know about Lady Bird Johnson, but you may not necessarily know about some of the plant lists that I'm gonna highlight here in just a second. Um, our Texas Wildscapes is under construction this year, but it will be referencing a lot of these different websites that are important. Um, as you can see here, um, the Audubon Society has a native plant list primarily for birds, but it is actually a very extensive database and I would encourage you to use it. I, I would say you could use that as a reference as well as the National Wildlife Federation and even the um, Natural Resource Conservation Service has a plant list. Unfortunately, the two on the bottom, National Wildlife Federation and Natural Resource Conservation Service, their websites don't offer a lot of meaty information about the plants. That's why I always refer to Lady Bird Johnson's Wildflower Center website because their database is incredible. So I would encourage you to use that anytime you're trying to get good meaty information about any kind of plant and also use their uh, various plant lists that they have. And this is just a sampling of just a few um, they have um, not only uh, species by state of Texas, but they also have it for the whole um, United States. So they have plant lists for the whole nation. In addition, they have um, plants by the eco regions. They're not exactly the same as what I showed you um, on my map, but very close. Edwards Plateau is listed and Texas Blackland Prairies is listed. So that would be appropriate for, for um, the New Braunfels area if um, you know which one of those two soil types you have. So you can find plants. And then when you pull up these um, plant lists, um, keep in mind the red circles here, you can actually narrow your search. And also they have the Texas Wildscapes plant list too on this website. It's a variety of a, a collection of different plant lists uh, um, that they have. And so you can look down here and you'll see the second um, red circle in the bottom here. It says sun, part shade, and shade. So if you're looking for shade or part shade, you can check those two boxes and it'll reduce the number of plants and kind of create a more selective plant list for you to reference. Um, and you, of course, can reference um, the, the soil type too um, that you have. So keep that in mind as a resource. Um, in addition, they even have a plant for dry shade in central Texas. So um, many of these plants, they have 40 uh, plants listed on this uh, list. So many of those plants will do probably fairly well for hill country and black clay soils, but you will have to kind of look to make sure that it is appropriate for your eco region. Um, so again, just something to know. And then the website is on the bottom right there. It's the wildflower.org backslash collections um, location on their website. Um, I am mentioning this, this is not an up-to-date um, nursery list, but there are a variety of nurseries in the San, Anta San Antonio and surrounding area. Unfortunately, some of them may have closed um, since 2020 um, with um, the, unfortunately the pandemic, um, but I really just wanted to highlight um, the seed source listing here, um, Douglas King seed in San Antonio and Native American seed, as well as um, seeds, uh, excuse me, uh, wild seed farms. Those are some that are at least local that you can go and visit personally if you wanna acquire seeds. But again, even some of these um, businesses sometimes will have those pre-packaged mixed seeds. And I would really encourage you to, uh, to try and select individual plantings for each season. And then um, that way you'll also know what you have coming up as things are coming up um, to look for, for those specific plants um, to see if you're having success or not. Um, as far as the local nurseries, you know, many of these do carry um, pl uh, native plants, but unfortunately I think Schultz is closed. And again, I, I apologize. I was not able to check all of these web uh, sites to see if they're still um, um, active. I think Hill Country Gardens has now changed names as well, the one in New Braunfels, um, I think. Um, so um, just be aware of that and call if you are taking a snapshot. Um, I do have the phone numbers listed so you can call and find out if they're still actively um, uh, in the business. Um, the, the one thing I want to mention here, especially if you're focusing on milkweeds, make sure that no neonicotinoids were used on your milkweeds being sold for monarchs. Because again, that's um, adding that poison into the plant. And ultimately, when those um, plants are eaten by the caterpillars, that neonicotinoid or those poisons are incorporated into the, the, the caterpillar and all, ultimately can wind up killing many of the caterpillars. So um, make sure that you ask when you're uh, dealing with a nursery to ensure that they are getting their plants from a wholesale nursery if they're not growing them themselves um, that does not use neonicotinoids. 
As far as types of wildlife we're gonna be looking at, even in shade conditions, of course, insects are number one. They're very important pollinators. Amphibians, reptiles, of course, all of these uh, wildlife species love shade conditions, especially if you have leaf litter in these shady areas. Birds as well, you'll have a host of different types of birds. In the, in the nation, we have about 840, 800, 850 species. And in Texas, um, we have about 650 species. So we have a ton of birds that either migrate or reside here. So what you do in your backyard can have a huge impact for these birds. And of course, habitat is being lost. These birds come back year after year, expecting to find the same habitat that was there the previous year as they're nesting and or migrating through. And so, um, you know, when that is lost due to the development, we have the opportunity to kind of put back some of that um, habitat for these variety of species, depending on which ones it is that you're wanting to attract. Again, going back to that homegrown national park. So we could have all of the United States be a homegrown national park um, in our urban communities. And I already homed in on this about focusing on the food source you have um, when you're picking your plants and just making sure that you have different blooms or fruits throughout the various seasons. Um, and, and of course, allowing insects into your garden is also important because keep in mind as uh, Telame mentioned um, in a lot of his programs, um, since he is an entomologist, he realizes the value of a lot of the insects um, that support a lot of our birds. Um, and it takes a ton of caterpillars to raise just one family of young birds. So, um, you know, the more insects you allow in your garden, the better. So let's focus on providing something in the shade. So why focus on shade? Of course, many of us have a lot of canopy trees. Um, and of course, those, the advantage there is it keeps us cool in the summer. It helps to uh, make our home a little bit more energy efficient because it provides that shade, helps to lower those utility bills. Um, and the plants themselves that are thriving in your shade garden, you have some already in those areas, oftentimes require a lot less moisture. So they can do just fine with less um, water, which of course in our Texas heat, is much appreciated. And of course, shady areas provide a, a serene environment, provided you don't have the big mosquitoes that I have as well in my shade garden. Um, I, I will admit, they seem to be a, big in Texas and a lot of them in Texas. Um, so I will tell you one little fact about mosquitoes. So don't assume that you know having a shade garden or even a shady area on your property is causing you to attract mosquitoes. Of course, it's the CO2 that is put off that draws them in. Mosquitoes can travel anywhere from 25 to 35 miles. So um, the most important thing is to ensure that around your garden, you don't have little pockets of water that are just sitting uh, because the female mosquitoes do have to lay um, their eggs in these very calm waters. And it can be even a little capful of water. Um, so, you know, if you're looking um, around your garden, make sure you just don't have anything that contains water long-term. And your bird bath, for the most part, shouldn't be a big problem because most mosquitoes require about six uh, days for them to convert from the larval stage to the adult stage. So as long as you're refreshing your water maybe twice a week in your uh, bird baths, it shouldn't really be a, a problem. And if you have a pond, adding some kind of circulation to it, um, then that, again, will deter any female uh, mosquitoes from laying her eggs on in it or on it, on the water surface. And then of course, if you have any type of uh, little fish, they oftentimes will take care of any mosquito larva that may wind up in your, your body of water if you have a little pond. As far as the types of shade. So, um, you know, there are different kinds and I will say, you know, most of you are probably here and you're probably um, experiencing what you would probably define as full shade. However, um, I will say full shade isn't really full shade. Full shade, when you see that next to a plant, means a full shade that we're thinking of is usually when we can't grow anything and it's really dark in an area of our garden because of all the canopy that's there. That's almost like putting a plant in a closet and closing the door. Without any sunlight, the plant will die. It's very hard to grow something without any kind of sunlight. Um, so there are different degrees and part shade is typically when you have about one half day of sun and one half day of shade. Double shade is when you really have a lot of filtered sunlight for half a day or more. Um, and then full shade, as you can see here, you get at least two hours of direct sunlight or about four hours of dapple shade throughout the day. 
So there is still sun hitting these plants, even in full shade conditions. So when these plants are labeled as such, um, then you know it's not truly like close the, the door kind of shade. Um, these little icons that you see here um, correlate to a plant list. And I did share that. Um, I don't know if um, Kathleen was able to retrieve it and post it, but um, I'm hoping that she'll be able to post it um, coming soon. But I don't know if you can see that. Um, um, again, I'm not sure what you're able to see, um, but there is a um, shade loving plant list that was created by a master naturalist back in 2001. I do not have the electronic version of it, unfortunately. It was lost with one of my old computers. So I only have the amazing um, document that he created in, I only have it printed. So I did create a PDF for Kathleen to post on your website. If for some reason she's not able to do that, don't hesitate to email me and just ask in the subject line, shade plant list. And that way I'll know immediately that you're just wanting a copy of it. Um, but it is an extensive um, plant list and it highlights primarily the central Texas area. And so these um, icons are on and next to every plant that's on that list. So that way you know whether or not it's a part shade plant, a dapple shade plant or a full shade plant. So in a part shade um, area, um, you know, a lot of people think, well, there's not a lot I can do in um, these shady areas, but I do want to encourage you that you can actually kind of plan something a little bit more extensive than just planting a plant here or there and kind of hoping for the best of luck, you know, with something thriving. You can actually create a wildflower meadow in a part shade area. You can also do either an annual or a perennial or even a mix of the two, a flower garden. And again, both of these, this meadow and or just a, a flower garden in general, um, again, as they're, if they're uh, receiving at least four to six hours of morning sun, especially the morning sun is usually less harsh on plants. So if you can, um, most plants will thank you if they get morning sun and less of the afternoon sun because the afternoon sun can be just brutal. And so um, if you um, decide to um, incorporate one of these types of things in your, on your property, these are great for pollinators and our pollinators are on the decline. So you know, this is something that they would welcome. And again, try to have different plants that bloom throughout the different seasons. So this would be an example of a um, part shade garden. So you have part of it in full sun. And of course, as that sun moves over, that sun will move over. So you'll have a large expansive area that is receiving sun typically, and it can oftentimes move um, as the sun moves across the sky. For dapple shade, um, and did I miss something? Okay, so dapple shade would be um, half day of sun and half day of shade. And um, again, here, most people don't think about it, but you can do a butterfly garden, even in the shade. And granted, it would be dappled shade. Um, you can even do a larval host plant garden. And that is where, if you're not familiar with that, um, butterflies, most butterflies, oftentimes, um, there are some butterflies that are very specific to certain plants. And um, so they require a certain plant in order to have their, to lay their eggs on that will encourage them to lay their eggs on it. And then ultimately as the larvae emerge, um, they will feed on that plant and devour it. And typically most of those plants will, they'll grow right back very quickly. So you don't need to worry if, if your garden is being devoured in a short time frame. Most people panic, especially if they're not familiar with um, larval host plants in general. Um, so um, creating a butterfly garden, you could use something like black-eyed Susan, white mist flower, your Engelman daisy. And these, again, all these plants that are, I'm listing here on the screen are plants that are on that shade loving plant list that I'm providing. Um, also wild blue aster and Turks cap or two others. Um, so these are great butterfly garden types of plants that will draw in a ton of butterflies. Sometimes I will say, if depending on how much light is hitting, some of these plants can wind up looking a little bit more leggy than meaning that they're kind of reaching, they're kind of far reaching um, versus being kind of more, um, kind of uh, more full and um, low growing, if you will, their, their normal kind of height. Sometimes they will reach a little bit more if, if there is too little sun reaching the area. Um, and they may sometimes not bloom quite as profusely. So again, you know, if you have at least four hours of, um, or a half a day of sun, then you shouldn't have a problem with um, having a nice butterfly garden and or larval host um, garden for a lot of our different species of butterflies. Um, passionflower vine is good for Gulf fritillaries. The inland sea oats is great for skippers. 
And um, unfortunately it's covered, so I don't know. Um, oh, let's see, oh, there we go. Top tree for swallowtails um, is uh, another good option if, depending on what types of butterflies you're wanting to attract. But again, not all butterflies require certain plants. Some are very generic, they'll lay their eggs on any plant, but then there are some that are very specific to a particular plant. And so um, those are the ones that you may want to try to incorporate. Let me see. Okay, so this is an example of dappled shade. You can kind of see there are a, a lot of little spots. Oops, uh -oh. sorry about that. Um, okay, there are a lot of little spots on the ground there. So that's um, what is considered dappled shade. And of course, as the sun goes over, um, those little spots kind of move and, and throughout your landscape. So um, you do have some sun, you get at least um, half a day of this filtered sunlight um, in your flower beds, hopefully, or in your garden where you're planning on planting. And then for full shade, most people, again, full shade is at least two hours of sun on a given area of your of your property, you can incorporate even a hummingbird garden. Um, and here, cedar sage, red columbine, turk's cap, red buckeye, a Texas buckeye, and cross vine are some good choices. Um, and if you love birds, of course, adding that understory, as I mentioned earlier, adding some understory trees to your existing canopy trees um, and ground covers in addition, will help to attract some uh, woodland species of birds that will thrive. Um, so again, as you can see in the image here, there are different birds that utilize different levels within a garden. So if you have those different levels, then you're very inclined to probably attract some of these new species of birds that you may otherwise not have currently. And this is an example of a full um, shade garden. Again, as you can see here, and this is primarily Virginia creeper, but I do like to highlight there is um, some poison ivy in there too. So the poison ivy are the leaflets and there's actually a poison ivy right here. One, two, three, right here, these three. But the rest are five leaflets and those are all Virginia creeper, which makes a really nice ground cover. But again, you can see here, it's what would be considered full shade conditions. Now, if you have total shade, the whole closet door kind of situation, well, the one thing that you can do is you can consider possibly uh, pruning some of your limbs back so you have more light penetration. Um, otherwise, you can remove some of the trees. If you're going to remove any trees, I would say do that cautiously and make sure that you're removing um, trees that, um, you know, old trees turn into snags, which are dead or dying trees that are wonderful for a variety of birds. So I wouldn't necessarily say um, to remove those. Um, if you have an abundance of a certain kind of tree, maybe remove some of those tr younger trees, but keep in mind, you wanna have replacement trees down the road. So don't just remove all of your young trees. You wanna have some there because some of the mature trees that you have on your property, especially like for instance, oaks, um, you may have a ton of young, um, uh, young oaks that you, know, you might be able to consider removing a few that will open up a space so you can maybe incorporate some of these ideas. Um, but um, keep that in mind. You wanna add that diversity. If you only have one or two of a certain plant, especially like uh, ash juniper, in urban areas, ash juniper is um, one of my favorite trees because it drinks just as much as an oak does, but it also offers that evergreen aspect. And especially if it's a female, it offers that fruit for birds. So keep that in mind. Don't remove something that you only have one or two of um, that adds to the diversity of the kind, different kinds of plants or trees that you have on your property. Um, and then worst case scenario, you can, if you can't plant anything there, add a deck, a patio or a playground for your kids um, and or mulch. Um, that's the other answer, um, just so that you don't have a bunch of mud uh, wind up occurring in that area, especially if you have pets that are constantly out there. Not that we have a lot of rainfall here, but just occasionally. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive into our different plants. And I'm gonna just showcase a bunch of different plants and a keep in mind, all of these plants on that plant list do highlight the region that they occur in. Most of these are going to be for the Hill Country and Blackland Prairie. Um, however, um, even if it's not listed on the plant list, I would definitely encourage you to try it because when it's in, in a typical urban area, remember you have those added soils that sometimes the developer brought in, sometimes these plants will still thrive quite nicely, even in urban areas. So it's worth trying if you feel like, you know, there's one that kind of excites you and you want to incorporate something new into your landscape. But frog fruit is what I would consider a ground cover. It is one that is not necessarily... Um, 
how can I say, it's, it's, it doesn't take a lot of heavy traffic, but it, it will take some light traffic. And it is for all eco regions. It gets about three to four inches in height. Um, it's almost evergreen for the most part, and it blooms May through October. So you get a lot of blooms from this particular plant, which is wonderful. Um, it does attract butterflies, of course, because the small blooms, they're small butterflies. So oftentimes you don't even see them, but it does thrive. Um, and I will say, um, in, this is a landscape in my neighborhood that had um, another ground cover, which is horse herb. Both horse herb and um, frog fruit were planted in this front landscape. And the frog fruit actually covered most of the inside of this bed. And the horse herb, everything you see that's green right there that looks like turf grass is actually horse herb. They used it as a grass, if you will, for their front yard, which what you see right there is their front yard. It's a very small front yard. And they, of course, also incorporated it in their backyard area too. Um, so um, this neighborhood is more of a natural neighborhood, I guess. Um, it less traditional in the sense that not everybody has your traditional turf grasses um, on their properties. They kind of have a variety of different native plantings that are growing in their yards. But this person got very lucky and had a bunch of horse herb on their property. So it's also a great uh, ground cover. Um, blooms almost continuously um, throughout the most of the blooming period or most of the growing season. But in the in the fall and in the winter, it typically will die back. Um, and then um, this one is pigeonberry. Uh, this one is a wonderful plant to have. Um, it is also in black clay and um, hill country soil types. It gets to about a foot and a half. And as you can see here, it'll have a bloom and a fruit on it. Um, and so it's typically got both on this plant throughout the warm growing season. And of course this attracts a ton of birds. So they love the fruit and you'll see um, small uh, pollinators on the, the blooms too, but they're usually very small. Um, wood fern is one that if you're wanting to have something, and this is a, also kind of considered a ground cover, not one that you typically would consider to walk on, but it kind of adds some interest into your landscape. Um, it is one of our more adaptable native ferns. Um, it tends to prefer moist soil. So, um, you know, again, really truly shady areas is much more preferred than in full sun conditions. So um, if you have that condition and or if you have a pond that you're incorporating in your landscape, this is a great fern to maybe add right alongside or very near the, the pond and maybe even create a bog nearby with. Um, as far as annuals are concerned, there are a variety of annuals. Again, my list that I have is very extensive. I'm just trying to highlight some of the plants that hopefully might get you excited and realize that, you know, and in many cases, we tend to, many of us may realize that these plants um, do well in the sun because some of these plants that I'm showing you <clears throat> not only do well in shady conditions, but they thrive in sunny conditions um, like Blackfoot Daisy. Um, so the, the thing to keep in mind is, is that, um, or this is also known as, I'm sorry, I said Blackfoot Daisy. I meant um, Black Eyed Susan, sorry about that. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is, is that, um, you know, we tend to use these plants in a certain manner and we, we should maybe consider trying them in a new way in the sense of maybe planting them in more shady conditions. Um, this one blooms May through September, about two feet tall, bees, butterflies, um, birds enjoy the seed, but the nectar of course is used by bees and butterflies. Deer usually avoid, and I will say that even though on this list there are some that are highlighted as deer avoiding plants, um, any time you have a herd that lives in proximity to your home, by the time you have a herd of 20 nibbling on a plant and saying, pooey, that didn't taste so good, the plant is gonna be gone. So unfortunately, you're not gonna wind up having a true deer resistant plant if you know a herd of 15 to, to 30 are nibbling on this plant, there won't be much left of the plant. So that is kind of the harsh reality. They will try anything. And during harsh, harsh times, they will eat anything. Um, so just keep that in mind when we have something labeled as deer resistant or, or usually don't are not eaten by deer. <coughs> this um, black eyed Susan, of course, blooms May through September. So this is a, a, a really good one, especially for the summer months. So that's kind of a, a hard time to find plants that are blooming. So this is one to maybe consider. It is an annual. So with most annuals, you want it to reseed itself. So make sure that you allow the, the seed heads to dry up and kind of 
um, uh, spread the seed, the dried seed, or you can do it manually yourself. You can um, pick, you know, cut them back and kind of just shake them uh, once they're dried in the area where you want them to grow. So that's uh, essentially a way to allow these plants to reseed themselves for you. So you're not constantly having to buy new plants. Um, as far as perennials, you know, perennials, the beauty of perennials is, is that they come back year after year. So you don't have to do quite as much work and you don't have to worry about allowing them to go to seed on their own. And of course, annuals sometimes can create uh, um, a situation where they're replanting themselves where you don't want them. But, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of pulling them back and up. But um, blue mist flower, as far as perennials go, this one, um, there are a variety of, of uh, different um, species of this flower, um, but um, keep in mind that, you know, the Gregii tends to be more sun, part shade conditions. Um, and then the, um, the one on the bottom um, is the cholestinum, I can't ever pronounce that one, cholestinum. Um, that's the, the species of that particular mist flower and it takes more part shade, but also sun too. Um, but you, the reason you want to know this is because sometimes, you know, we uh, can plant these plants thinking they're full sun plants and we put them and they're really more of a shade loving plant. And when you put them in full sun conditions, you, you just find that you're constantly having to water the plant because it's constantly wilting. Um, so it is important to know um, the genus species of the plant and making sure that you're getting the right plant. And when you, I have the common names listed on this in this presentation. But keep in mind, each and every plant that I am highlighting does have a, a, a scientific name associated with it. So that's the genus and the species name. And when you're looking for these plants off of the plant list, you want to make sure that you're getting the genus species, the correct one, and that's listed on this plant list. Um, and don't go by the common name alone, because sometimes you can wind up with a, uh, with a plant that just isn't the right one. And I had that happen with this uh, particular mist flower. I planted it in full sun and it happened to be the shade loving variety. So it was just not happy where I planted it. Um, and so I had to replant it later down the road. But this one is one mist flower. It's like a butterfly magnet. And most of you may already know this, um, but I had this one growing in my front area of my drive. And I literally was at a curve and I would oftentimes when I was sitting in my living room, see, especially when the butterflies were all over it, um, the car would oftentimes create a bit of a, a wind that made the butterflies um, kind of rise to the top and um, or they would kind of float and then they would wind up landing back on the mist flower to nectar some more. And the cars would see, I guess, this mass of, of butterflies and literally I could see them stop their car and then slowly back up so they could view it again. So it definitely is an attraction uh, for your neighbors as well as for a variety of butterflies. Um, and mist flower in general, general is just a, a butterfly magnet, regardless of whether you get the Ford variety or um, this next one, which is um, uh, more of a shrub, which is also known as bone set. And this one bone set um, gets to about three feet in height, um, blooms August through October. So it's more of a fall bloomer. Um, again, both in Black Line Prairie and um, Hill Country um, attracts tons of uh, butterflies with its showy uh, plants. The thoroughwort um, or um, Eupatorium havanensis is more the hill country variety. And that's, I know we have it out at Government Canyon State Natural Area where my office is at. So it, it does really well out in that area. And then cedar sage is um, another one that typically, as the name implies, likes to grow under ash juniper or cedar. So um, it tolerates um, the, the soil underneath um, ash junipers, which a lot of variety of plants typically don't like. Um, and so um, it can do really well. It blooms March through July. Um, it's an early nectar source for a lot of our migrating hummingbirds, so very important for that purpose. But again, um, it's something I would encourage you to plant even if you don't have ash juniper on your property, but you have shade conditions. This is uh, almost like a full shade kind of plant. Doesn't get very tall, only about a foot in height. Um, very much worth um, incorporating into your landscape. And this one is frostweed. Um, frostweed is one that I love. Um, I actually have it in my backyard. I live now um, in my second home, which is more hill country. And um, it just happened to crop up in my backyard. 
And so I've just let it grow wherever it wants to grow. The key to this one, this is one that you're not going to necessarily find in the nursery trade readily. So you may have to try and see if you can source some seed from a friend. Um, but I will tell you that um, the thing I love about frostweed is that it tends to be blooming around the time um, in early fall when our humming, excuse me, when our monarchs are migrating through. So they rely on this heavily, believe it or not, um, as a nectar source if you're in that migratory range for our monarchs. Um, and the other cool thing is that it does attract a lot of little bugs. And I, I witnessed tons of hummingbird activity around this particular plant. I will say it is a tall and lanky plant and it's kind of hard to see in this image, but it does get about, I mean, four feet, sometimes even five feet, I would say. Um, it has real big leaves. So it kind of looks kind of very cool. I, I don't know, it, most people don't find it very attractive because the seed head is very small compared to the big body of all the leaves. But um, one thing that we found out um, uh, here in our home was that if we cut it back around mid-July, we wind up getting new growth. Um, it's kind of multi-stocked instead of single-stocked. And then it only gets to about three to four feet in height. And then it puts on even more blooms on each stalk. So it tends to look more like a bouquet versus one single stalk that gets top heavy and then falls to the ground, which is its natural habit. So that's just something to consider if you have frost weed on your property to kind of manage it just a little bit differently and you'll get a little bit of a different look that may be a little bit more appealing to you. I'm sorry, sometimes my computer is not wanting to, there we go. Um, this is Rose. Um, this one is one that I, um, it, 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 the mother plant lasts for about three to four years. And so you definitely want to allow the young to propagate beneath the mother plant because they ultimately will replace the mother plant when you put it in the ground. So um, it is, and it will reseed into other areas too, but it's not real highly aggressive by any means. Um, let's see, um, I just wanted to mention. So this is rock rose. Um, sorry about that, did I not? Oh, there it is. Um, so rock rose is um, primarily more in the hill country, but I also had it growing in Blackland Prairie soil types over at my old house. So I do know it thrives there. So you can use it um, in, in Blackland Prairie soil types. Um, it is primarily evergreen, but it will die. Uh, um, it's almost evergreen is what I should say. Excuse me. It's not exactly evergreen. In some situations, it, it will kind of persist a little bit. Um, but um, it does have a long bloom period for the, most of the year actually. So it has these beautiful pink flowers um, and it does prefer um, protection from the afternoon sun if you can, but uh, again, it will attract some butterflies and remember to just allow the, the young plants to grow beneath it. Tropical sage by far is probably one of my absolute favorite uh, plants to recommend for true shady conditions. It will thrive in very poor soils in very heavy, darkish um, areas. It may not put out as much blooms in the darker areas, but it is, it's, it definitely does great in full shade conditions. Um, again, it still needs that light, not closet light, you know, not, not, not the closet kind of uh, shade conditions. It does still require light, but it is one that I love and it can be used as a ground cover. You can even um, cut it back, mow it down, um, and it'll just put out more, um, um, uh, uh, um, branches or, or, or um, it'll just, it'll be a little bit more fuller and it'll put out a little bit more blooms if you cut it back. Um, tropical sage, um, as I mentioned, of course, it's one that if you are having problems with growing anything in a, an area on your property, I would highly encourage you to try this one in seed form. Just plant it by seed and see if you can get it to come up from seed. That would be the less expensive route if you have a big area, for instance. Um, but it's definitely one worth trying because of the fact that it, it likes any kind of soil, poor soils, good soils, and, um, and it does seem to thrive once it's established. So just water it in and, and cross your fingers because this one might actually uh, do the, the job of putting something down in an area where you really normally can't get anything else to grow. I would definitely give this one a try. Um, there are um, some native Aurelias, the wild Aurelia that you see here. <clears throat> and there um, is 
you see the dog right here. This whole patch of um, Rulia is Rulia sclerosa. I don't think it's readily available in the nursery trade. Um, I think we got it through a native plant um, uh, society exchange and we planted it on the side of our house and it really does well. We mow it like once, maybe twice a year and it just keeps this really nice low growing leafy um, structure and it just thrives. I mean, this would almost be kind of considered dappled shade, I guess, but it really does well, even when it's heavier canopy and less sun than what you're seeing with this image on the left there with the dog in the middle there. And, um, and it does put out blooms even in the shady uh, times. Um, it does have, let me see, when does it normally bloom? Um, the Katie Ruelia is um, one that you can use. It's, um, it's the most uh, common one that you can find in the nursery trade. Um, the one that you want to avoid though is the Mexican variety, um, which is on the bottom right. It will get to about four feet in height and it will take over a yard. My mother had it gifted to her from a neighbor and I fought it for probably four to five years before I got rid of it all. Cause I, I was just like, it was taking over. So keep that in mind. The Mexican variety is the one that you normally can find in the nursery trade. So just be aware of that one. But the sclerosa is the one that I loved cause it was, it's very low growing and I still have it. We planted it 20 years ago. It's still thriving in that area. And it crops up here and there around my yard. But again, if it does, I usually just let it be. It's a wonderful plant. Um, Hinkley Columbine, as you see here, is one, there are a variety of um, columbines. There's the red version and the yellow version and where they meet, sometimes they will hybridize um, between the two sub uh, species. And so um, this one, um, the Hinkley columbine is actually endemic to, um, uh, let's see, it is endemic to Presidio County, but it is in the nursery trade of all things. So people have it growing throughout San Antonio, Central Texas. The wild red columbine, is the Candenensis, and it's primarily in the hill country area. Um, they do hybridize and you can, um, like I said, get a variety of different colors. You know, sometimes there's a mix of red and yellow, which is kind of cool to try out, you know, if you plant it on, in your property. So it attracts hummingbirds and butterflies and deer usually avoid this. It is an evergreen, so that's the nice thing. And I know I am probably running out of time. So um, I just wanna make sure that we cover a little bit here, but this is Zexmenia. And this one is another one that is wonderful if you have um, an edge of a garden that you want things to cascade over on, um, whether it's rocks or whether it's um, a wall. Um, this one just does really, really well. And it uh, blooms May through November. Deer typically avoid this one as well, but it's a beautiful plant that I just absolutely adore. I love this plant. American Beautyberry, now we're talking a little bit more shrubs. Um, it does have a beautiful fruit um, that is devoured by birds, um, but you'll also note it's, it oftentimes will have its fruit throughout most of the fall. So I, I'm thinking maybe it's not a favored fruit um, because otherwise if it was, you think every bird in, in the area would have devoured every single fruit off of it. But it does because of that, um, it does offer that beautiful um, kind of purplish color in your garden. And um, I have seen this in a neighborhood where it was literally six feet tall. And I think it was because they were using some type of special food, plant food for it. Normally it's about four, maybe five feet tall, but normally like four feet. And in deep shade, like in my garden, I can barely get it to get three feet tall. So um, I guess it just depends on the soil type and how much um, conditioning you have um, as to whether um, it thrives or not. But it. Um, usually we'll offer the fruit um, August through November. So the fall period is when uh, it will help a lot of our birds uh, for feeding. This one, chili bikini, if you like hot and spicy and you wanna, and you wanna grow your own chili bikini, you can definitely use this for your own cooking needs, um, but you'll have to compete with a lot of the birds because they love it as well. Um, chili bikini tends to be one that, um, it's a small shrub, only about four feet in height. It can be grown in, a, a small planter um, if you want to grow it for yourself um, and it will offer both the bloom and the fruit on the plant typically. Um, it tends to be, um, it'll fruit from April through November. So you'll have these little red chili bikinis all over the plant for most of the growing season. So uh, again, you can take advantage as well as the wildlife. 
Red yucca is another, um, again, shade. Most people think of this as a, a full sun condition type of plant, but that's what I'm trying to emphasize today is that some of these plants we have in our head that they're full sun. That's where we see them mostly, but they will tolerate some shade. And red yucca will do part and dapple shade. Um, of course, deer will eat the blooms, but they typically leave the leafy part alone. Um, and of course, your hummingbirds will be all over this plant provided the deer don't get to the blooms first. But if you don't have a problem with deer, this one's definitely one worth considering. The one thing I will say is I see this oftentimes planted very in close proximity to one another. And it will, a mature red yucca will get um, about five feet in diameter. So you wanna make sure that you give these plants plenty of space to grow into their mature size. Uh, so that is another thing that when you're selecting your plants to keep in mind as you're planting them on your property, so you don't have a jumble of plants growing into each other that will create a maintenance nightmare for you down the road, or maybe it just looks too thick. Um, and this is one of those plants that if they're so jumbled together, sometimes it can look a little bit too unwelcoming or just too unsightly for some people. So they wind up removing it later after it's matured. So um, keep that in mind. In many cases, you want these plants to kind of showcase themselves. Uh, Texas elbow bush, I'm just going to mention this only because it, it's not one you'll get in the nursery trade, but it is one that you can often see in nature. If you happen to have this on your property, um, it has, as you can see in the, this uh, picture to the left, it has um, limbs that are kind of almost at a 90 degree angle. You can see it better on the second one down. Um, from the main um, center limb. So that's um, one way to identify it, but it is one of the first plants that will bloom in late winter in February. So, um, so it is one of the first nectar producing plants for a lot of our butterflies and they thrive on this plant, um, especially if they're emerging, if there's, you know, like sometimes in February we have warm, like this year we've had warm, then cold and warm. So um, this plant oftentimes is in bloom. And so our butterflies can take advantage of the very first nectar source just before spring is actually starting up. Turk's cap is one that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, again, this is a good full shade plant almost evergreen, attracts the butterflies and the hummingbirds, and songbirds love the fruit. You can eat the fruit yourself, it kind of tastes like a cucumber, um, but again, it'll get a little bit leggy and full shade conditions, may not put out as much blooms, but I, it's definitely worth having and trying. I have it in my garden and I just it, I just have my patches of Turk's cap throughout the, the woodland that I have. Um, Anaconda orchid tree is another one worth trying. It's more hill country, but you could try it in black lead prairies. I think I had it, I did have it growing in my old house in black clay soil, um, but it was elevated. It was a little bit of an elevated bed, um, but this one will sucker out and it's a, just a beautiful plant, has a beautiful bloom, adds some white color. Um, on a concha orchid li literally, or usually will uh, bloom March through May, um, but it does prefer hill country and limestone kind of growth. So you'll probably fare better if you're in the hill country with that particular plant. Mexican plum um, is another one. Again, there's so many plants that, that we oftentimes, again, see in full sun conditions and we don't think that, hey, they'll do well in dappled or um, part shade. So uh, Mexican plum is one along with um, red, red buds. Sorry about that. I thought the red bud was the next one in line. But Mexican plum will put out fruit and of course the bloom attracts a variety of pollinators. Um, and then red buckeye is one that um, is kind of like, uh, it actually has two varieties or subspecies. You have the red and the yellow. And just like the, uh, the columbine, they will hybridize where the two meet. And you can see this um, in at Walker Ranch off of 281. If y'all ever go there um, and you're walking around, um, you may see some of these that look like the one on the left pictured here where there's like yellow and red on it. So um, these two buckeyes, um, the red, they tend to have uh, leaflets of five and um, they've got a beautiful bloom that will attract a variety of um, butterflies as well as hummingbirds too. You'll see hummingbirds all over this. And then rough leaf dogwood, 40 species of birds love this plant. And it is more of a uh, kind of a, a, a taller, small tree, if you will. So you want to be careful where you plant it. Make sure you give it plenty of space. The, the blooms actually smell like um, guano or cat litter, <laughs> um, bad cat litter. Um, so you definitely smell that ammonia smell. 
and flies are the, the species that typically pollinate this plant. So you might not want to plant this right outside a window that you open uh, in the spring a lot, because um, that's not exactly the smell you want drifting in if you're sitting in your living room or in your bedroom, for instance. Um, but again, the fruit is what's amazing about the rough leaf dogwood. And as I mentioned, there are 40 different species of um, birds that will feed on this and deer typically do avoid rough leaf dogwood. Um, and it's usually blooming April through um, August. And it also has a, a fruit that is eaten by birds August through October. Texas mountain laurel, another one that is commonly used in full sun, but also will do uh, well in kind of shady conditions, part shade and dappled shade. Um, and even in some cases, almost full, sh uh, full shade conditions as noted, you know, as we defined it anyway. Um, so it, it will get tall and lanky sometimes if it's too shaded, but it still thrives. Um, here's the Texas red bud. It's one of the first things that blooms. Um, so again, very important for a lot of our young um, pollen or for our pollinators in the early spring. Um, great understory plant, one that again, that we don't normally plant uh, in a shady area. And then Yopon holly is an evergreen plant. You can see that it can be pruned in a variety of ways, as you see in the top right. Um, that makes it a little bit tougher for birds to get into that kind of a, a setting, but um, you know, I kind of like it more natural, but it is very slow growing. And you do want to make sure this is one where you do want to get the female plant. Some of these plants, there's a male and female, and this one happens to be the female that offers the fruit. And um, as I mentioned, it can be very slow growing. And then um, going into vines quickly, the, this is cross vine. Um, you can use it to um, plant um, in your outdoor areas. It does really nicely, offers primarily the bloom that will attract a variety of hummingbirds, some butterflies, some of the larger butterflies. And um, cross vine, let me see, it blooms primarily April through June and it's almost evergreen. So um, one to consider. It is not to be confused with um, trumpet creeper, which is a very aggressive vine. This one um, is um, not as aggressive and it just is it's just a really nice one to incorporate. Virginia creeper is one that we highlighted earlier. It has beautiful fall color. The fruits are eaten uh, by a variety of birds as well. So again, you can use it as a ground cover or something that climbs a structure if that's what you want. Um, it um, blooms primarily, um, well, actually it's not blooming, it's fruiting, excuse me, September through November. So that's something to keep in mind um, if you want something for the fall. And, um, and then this is poison ivy. So leaflets of three, let it be is the saying, but Virginia creeper has leaflets of five, kind of like the red buckeye. And then grasses, uh, just want to round this out with um, just a few. Eastern gamma grass is one that is very tall. It can be very tall, actually. Um, it gets anywhere from three to eight feet tall. So you want to be very selective where you put this one. But it is very, or it can be very ornamental, along with inland sea oats and a lot of other grasses. Um, but inland sea oats is a great shade loving plant for sure. This one has nice fall color and then it turns brown. So even when the leaves or excuse me, the seeds are still intact, it still has beautiful structure. Um, and then um, of course it will um, spread on its own. So over time, you may have to thin it back depending on where you plant it. But I, in my woodland, I just kind of let it grow and I've never had a problem in my deep shady woodland. It kind of finds those little dappled spaces on its own and thrives where it will grow. And it will also do well in sun too. Nolina is one that I incorporated in my yard. Um, it does like um, dappled and um, part shade. And Nolina though is very, very slow growing. I planted mine from Lady Bird Johnson probably about 15 years ago. And I don't think it's grown much <laughs> in 15 years. So I have a feeling it just isn't liking where I put it. But in any case, it's not a fast growing one, but it's still a very interesting one to add to a garden. Um, it has a very thick, wiry uh, leaf and just is kind of a cool structure to add some different structure um, in the landscape. So this is inland sea oats in a garden. Um, and these are just some gardens. These are not, I couldn't find any great native plant gardens, but I just wanted to kind of imagine, you know, replacing some of these um, probably non-native plants with some of the native plants, such as, you know, maybe imagining Zexmini or Black-Eyed Susan being the yellow flowers on the left and having uh, red bud or Mexican plum or mountain laurel being in the middle with whatever plant that is. And then a variety of other Turks cap and grasses possibly on the outer perimeter. So, um, you know, and even maybe a wood fern if, it, if it'll allow. So again, you can replace existing landscapes with some of our natives 
Again, I'm just kind of imagining a landscape with more natives. Um, as you can see here, again, wood ferns, frog fruit, horse herb, um, inland sea oats. To me, this would be these would be great plants to incorporate instead of whatever it is that you're seeing in, in the image. Maybe even red yucca or, or inland sea oats in the foreground there. That actually looks almost like a red yucca, but it's not. It's some type of a, a grass. I'm not sure what it is. And then here's another one just along a trail. On the left, it could be um, red yuccas, wild aurelias, maybe inland sea oats. On the right, um, it could be bone set, for instance. You know, those, those are non native white flowers or even frost weed um, on the right. So um, it's just a matter of, you know, letting it, it doesn't have to have necessarily a distinct style, um, but you can just plant randomly. You know, ideally, you want to plant low growing. In the foreground, higher ones in the plant in the back part, so that you can kind of see if you're walking on a path or if you're looking out a window that you kind of can see the plants in front and in the middle and then in the back. So that's really the only thing I would suggest. And of course, allow each plant to have its space. So uh, thank you so much for allowing me to go over. Um, I, I'm so sorry I, I went over. I wasn't sure. Um, I didn't realize it was going to take me quite this this long. And I do hope that y'all are there. I hope I